Well, we welcome you back this time to session 13 of our study of spiritual gifts. Thank you for joining us here in the classroom, wherever you are in the world. In the last session, we talked about the incredible diversity that's taking place in the Church of Jesus Christ as the gospel is being preached to all the world and as people in Latin America and Africa and Asia are responding in great numbers to the gospels. And therefore, the shift of power, the center of Christianity is shifting from North America to South America. And this will present incredible challenges to maintain our unity. In this session, we're going to move from the one principle we talked about last time, diversity within unity, and we'll talk about interdependence within unity. And if you'll turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in the last session, we talked about verses 12 through 14. We'll continue our study now with verses 15 through 21. Please follow along with me as, as I read. I will be stopping along the way uh, so that you're not hearing the entire section. Beginning in verse 15, 1 Corinthians 12, If the foot should say, Because I'm not the hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not be for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason cease to be the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If we were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Have you ever worked with somebody on a team who's not a team player? That is a person who's on the team, but they're not part of the team. They have their own agenda. They want to do things their own way. They don't like what the team's doing. They're the ones that are constantly complaining. They have other ideas. They grumble about how things should be instead of how things are. It is very hard to work with somebody who is like that on a team. Somebody who doesn't want to work interdependently with the other members of the team. They want to be on their own. Well, in my life, I have been a boss. And as a boss, which is not easy, I have served on a team with the people who reported directly to me. In my case, I was the superintendent of a school. And the people on the team were the principals, the directors of the school, the headmasters. There was a person on my team who didn't want to work with the team. They wanted to do things their way, not my way. For example, there was a situation where there were two very bright students in third grade. And this principal wanted to move those students to fourth grade, uh, fifth grade, and to skip a grade. That happens sometimes with very bright students. Now, I had been told that that's what the principal was thinking, and I agreed with it. That wasn't what the principal really wanted to do. The principal decided, I'm going to move them two grades not just from third to fifth, but third to sixth grade. And she never told me. That is not being a team player. You can imagine as the boss, as the person that she was responsible to, I wasn't happy. I needed to be a part of that decision because a third grader is much different than a sixth grader. They're little. Sixth graders are big. And I would not have allowed that. And this principle did everything possible to make our lives miserable on the team. Did not really cooperate 
we would go out to have lunch or we would go after school to uh, have coffee or soft drink and she wouldn't come. Incredible. Bottom line was this principal wasn't do, pulling their weight. They weren't doing their fair share. They were doing something completely different and as the boss, I fired the person. Not easy to do, but I can't have somebody on my team who doesn't want to be part of the team. Well, Paul repeatedly has talked about we are one body. In essence, we're a team and we're made up of different parts. And we all have to work together interdependently. We have to cooperate with each other. We have to try to work together for the greater good. And if we disagree, we have to go along with what the majority thinks is the best thing to do. And when we begin to grumble, and when we begin to gossip, and when we begin to argue, the unity of the body suffers. And it only is maintained when we remain interdependent, everybody doing their part. In the section that I just read, Paul talks about two different uh, situations that I think bring up a motivation that sometimes happens in the church. He's being a little uh, ridiculous in his illustrations. How can the foot talk to the, you know, hand? It doesn't happen. But he's using this to make a point. And in the point he's saying, now, if I'm the foot and I'm way down there, gee, you know, I'd rather be the hand. Hand's much more important. Foot's not down there, it's down there. Nobody sees the foot. People see the hand. I can only walk with the foot. The hand can go here and there and grab things. Much more important. And because I can't be it, I'm not part of the body. And Paul says, well, of course you still are part of the body. You're just not a contributing member of the body. And then he goes on to make a point a second time. Same thing, but for emphasis. How can the ear say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not part of the body? Hearing is great. You know, I hear things, but when I see, I can see the whole world of what's happening. They're much more important if they're the eye. And because I can't be the eye, I'm not going to be on the team. So there and I'm going to take my ball and I'm going to go home. I'm not playing. And Paul says, no, you're still part of the team. You're just not a very good member of the team. So you see how he's making a kind of a joke of it to say, you can't work on your own. You got to work together. It's ridiculous to think you're not going to be part of the body of Christ. Once you accept Jesus as your savior, you're always a part of the body of Christ. It's just, are you doing anything to help the body of Christ? Or are you just doing your own things? I think that what this shows here is somebody who's envious. Envy is one of the uh, seven deadly sins that have been talked about. Envy is when I want what you have. Envy is, I don't like you because what you have is something I want, but I can't get. And therefore, I won't be friends with you. I won't work with you. I won't talk to you. I won't associate with you. Now, let's face it. All of us have been like this at some time. All of us have looked at someone and said, I'd like to be like that person. Why couldn't I be just a little taller? Which I have thought from time to time. Why couldn't I have nice hair? Why could I not have glasses and just be able to see? Why couldn't I be thinner? Oh, woe is me. Life is terrible. 
And then I look at somebody who's handsome and rugged and tall and manly and has a nice set of hair and good teeth and doesn't wear glasses. And the women all go, ooh, that's envy. And women especially do this. Come on, women, admit it. You have another woman walk into the room and you immediately check that woman out. All right, does her hair look good? All right, does her blouse go with her slacks? And ooh, those earrings, they're far too long. And women say, she doesn't have the right color hair or she's parted it the wrong way. Or look at the colors. I mean, she's got purple on the top and blue on the bottom. And what's she thinking? And those shoes, oh, they were last year's style. Come on, women, you do that. Men don't do that. We do other things. I hope I have that job. I'd like to have that car. I'd like to be more attractive, which I think women do too. But we are very different people. Envy is sin. In the body of Christ, Jesus says, don't be envious of each other. I made you a masterpiece. Be content with who you are. There was a famous study done of people who were considered very attractive. All right? People who were models, people who were in Hollywood, and they were very handsome as men, very gorgeous as women. And they asked him a series of questions. Is there anything about your body that you would change? Every single one of them had something about their body they would change. I'd like my eyes a different color. I wish my nose wasn't so big. I wish my mouth wasn't so big. I wish that my ears were a little smaller. These are beautiful people. And they weren't content with who they had been made to be. God made them, from man's point of view, to be very attractive, yet they weren't happy. So what God is saying to us, what Jesus wants us to do, be content with who you are. You are a masterpiece. As I said in a previous session, you are a treasure child of the Most High God. And yes, maybe you're the foot and you're not the hand. God wanted you to be the foot. Be content. Maybe you're the ear, not the eye in the body. Be content. The eye is not the ear. The hand is not the foot. You have a special part to play. And then Paul goes on to say, if the whole body were the eye, like everybody's the eye now, what happens to hearing? And if everybody would be the hand, what would happen to walking? It's the idea that we need each other. We've been placed right where God wants us to be for a reason, and when we were designed, we were designed with that place in mind. And in our very first session, I talked about having a sense of your unique purpose in life. In many ways, your spiritual gift is your purpose in life. It is certainly the purpose of you being in the body of Christ. So be content with it. And the amazing part in verse 18, it says, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body. Just like you don't get to choose your spiritual gift, you don't get to choose the role you play in the body. And not only has he arranged uh, the parts in the body, it's every one of them. It's like the jigsaw puzzle illustration I used in a previous session. God knew which piece should go here and which piece should be the corner piece and which piece should be right in the middle. He knew your part in the whole scheme of the jigsaw puzzle of the church. 
And so where he's placed you is right where he wants you to be. He says, he's arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Then in verse 21, he changes just a little bit. Instead of talking about envy, he has another motivation in mind that creates a lack of harmony. Uh, it creates conflict in the church, disrupts the unity. Let's look at verse uh, 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. First he's saying, we need each other. But underneath he's saying, there are people whose motive is pride, who are arrogant, who are leaders and want everybody to know it, who are doing something important in the church, using their gift in a very noticeable way, and they want everybody to realize, I'm important, you're not, so I don't need you. You know, God knows that I'm doing the important stuff. <laughs> You're doing the stuff that, yeah, it's got to be done, but it's not important. So in this case, Paul has said in this passage, we need each other. And we should look out for being envious of people who have a different uh, role than we have. And when we have a role that's very visible and people notice us and it's a strategic role in the body, don't be prideful. Remember that wherever you've been placed, you've been placed there because God placed you there. And he arranged the church, every one of us, just where he wanted us to be. So the question becomes, where does he want us to be? So we're going to look at another passage related to this. Would you open up, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10? And in this passage, Paul's going to talk about the field that's been assigned to us, the territory that is ours, our place in the body, our piece of the puzzle. And he's going to give us some important uh, information and challenges about what it is we should do. Let's look at... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to do verses 12 through 18. And as I read this passage, I am going to emphasize certain words on purpose because they explain this idea that each of us has a certain territory. So beginning with verse 12, going down to verse 18, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond our private limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned us. A field that reaches even to you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you. For we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we be go beyond our limits by boasting of the work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about the work done, already done in another man's territory. But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Now I emphasize those words for a reason. You saw words like, the field God assigned us. You saw words like the limits of our work, the area of our activity, another man's work, 
All of these say each person in the body has a certain area assigned to you. You may remember back in the book of Acts, Paul desperately wanted to move from Achaia, which is Greece, into Asia, which would include Europe. And he had a uh, awareness that the Holy Spirit was putting a restriction on him and saying, don't go there. Don't go there. It was another man's territory. Paul's territory went as far as Achaia. And God had somebody else in mind to go into Europe. So we can see just in that illustration that we each have a territory, and sometimes the Holy Spirit says, no further. And then sometimes we have a situation Paul had in a dream where a man from Macedonia said, come over and help us. So the Holy Spirit is saying, Paul, go to Macedonia. I'm enlarging your territory. I'm not letting you go to Russia. I'm not letting you go to Germany. I'm not letting you go to England. Go to Macedonia. That's your, the limit of your territory. And if you go there, you're going to another man's work. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. I'm going to show you a diagram that I think it helps us a little bit in understanding this whole idea of where our territory is. And I have to give credit to another person for giving this to me. I did not come up with this. So when I teach, I think it's important for me to give credit to those who have helped me understand something that then I teach to others. Otherwise, as Paul would say, I'm commending myself like I came up with this. I didn't. But it's very, very helpful. Imagine that this chalkboard is the entire realm of God's kingdom. The things seen, the things not seen, the things present, the things past, the things future. It's all of God's kingdom. And then I'm going to draw a Venn diagram. Now, I wasn't very good in math in school, but I do remember this was a Venn diagram. And in this, I want you to think in times past. Within the whole realm of God's kingdom, there really were just two groups of people. There were the Jews and there were the Gentiles. That was it. You're either in the Jewish kingdom or you're in the Gentile kingdom. And then, of course, there was some crossover between the two of them. It wasn't like they didn't have anything to do with each other. So, whose assigned field did Paul give to the Jews? He gave it to Peter. And he said, that's your assigned field. And especially, Peter, I want you to work in Jerusalem. So Peter, though he had contact with uh, people who were Gentiles, his primary field was working with the Jews in a specific location, Jerusalem. And then the Gentiles. Of course, if this was Peter, then we know this was Paul. And he was given the task of going, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And he wasn't confined to a certain city. Instead, he was confined to the known world except Europe. Paul, at the end of his life, said that he desired to go to Tarsus and to Spain. He never got a chance to do that because he was killed. 
He was martyred. But he always wanted to expand his kingdom and the Holy Spirit restrained him. So he had a much larger field. Peter had a much smaller field. Does that mean Peter's any less important than Paul? Of course not. They both have contributed greatly to the kingdom. But each of them had a different place. And then in this middle territory, there was a person who really bridged both worlds. And that was Barnabas. Barnabas had been an ally with Paul reaching out to the Gentiles. But they had a division, a dispute over whether John Mark should go with them on the second missionary journey. John Mark, the person who wrote the book of Gospel of Mark, had on the previous missionary journey abandoned them. He left them. We don't know why, but he went home. And Paul didn't like that. And Barnabas wanted him to go along. And Paul didn't. And they fought about it to such an intense degree that they split into two. And Barnabas really went to both camps to try to extend the gospel. Now, how does this apply to you? Well, let me just change the two circles to modern times and to where your position might be. There are still two groups today. It's not Jews and Gentiles. It's those who are the church and those who are unbelievers. I mean, you're in one camp or another. There's no middle ground. There's interaction between the two. But there's no third category. Either you belong to Christ or you belong to the world. That's it. So, where do you belong? In the Great Commission, it says, Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, which is evangelism. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them all that I have commanded you. Within the Great Commission, which our positions in Christ flow from. The Great Commission is the great unifying body of the church. Most of us either have evangelism or discipleship as our primary ministry. Well, where would evangelism most likely go? Probably with unbelievers. You don't have to evangelize the already saved. So, if your heart is more in spreading the gospel, bringing people to Christ, chances are your position, your field, your area of activity is in the world. And so you need to go to the places where people in the world are likely to be. Jesus went to places where the sinners were, the unbelievers. He was criticized for that. But he had a heart for both, and he evangelized the unbelievers going to places where they're at. All right? Then, if you're in the church, chances are it's discipleship. Some people call it today spiritual formation. I am in this camp. God has called me to teach Christians. It isn't that I shouldn't evangelize. It's that my heart and my giftedness lies here, others there. And others have a heart to work with both and bring them together to bring harmony to the world. Well, in this session, we have talked about the importance of interdependence, the ridiculousness of being either envious or being prideful. Instead, being content, knowing God's placed us where he wants us. And then looking at this diagram, seeing that we have an assigned field. And it's a great place to serve. And so serve both places for now. 
and then notice where your heart is drawn. In the next session, we're going to move to another one of the principles, the equality of the gifts. Please join us for that session.